All right. Well, welcome, ladies and gentlemen. It is great to join you from the LBJ uh, Washington Center, part of America's Future Series, and what a great virtual summit this has been already. We look forward to, uh, to sharing uh, a few words of insight uh, in what's going on. A uh, huge shout out to America's Future Series and, uh, and the leadership that David Hamilton provides on a daily basis to bring together uh, experts from across national security to talk about the problems that we face as a nation and, uh, and the solutions, more importantly, that we're going to get after. So we are absolutely thrilled to be here. Uh, David has often challenged me of, I can help assemble the panel uh, that, uh, that I'm asking you to lead, or you can come in with, uh, with some like-minded folks. And I always go for that option because I have assembled a group of not only professionals, but friends uh, that share in this space, and I'm sure are going to blow your socks off by their insights uh, and their thoughts and their vision of where they uh, want us to go. Now, by way of introduction, I've assembled this panel, and we call it America's Digital Future, Charting a Path Forward by Harnessing Technology. Uh, the way that I'm going to handle this, I'm going to offer a couple of introductory remarks, and then I'm going to introduce each of the panelists one at a time, let them offer uh, some remarks, and, uh, and then if we have time at the end, we'll kind of get some engagement going, ask a few questions, and see where we go from there. Um, by way of a spoiler alert, the way that we've assembled this panel is uh, a little bit of enterprise and worldview, and then all the way down to the state level. So tactical to strategic, uh, world to state. And so that's a little bit of a spoiler alert about who you're going to hear from today. But uh, by way of introduction, my name is Chad Radigee. Uh, I had the privilege of serving our nation as a uh, as an officer in the United States Air Force for 29 years. I recently retired uh, about two months ago, and, uh, and, uh, and here I am, and br broad, new, uh, broad new vision, broad new ideas. The idea was to uh, start chapter two by doing something meaningful. And, uh, and my meaningful uh, search uh, began in the, uh, in the August timeframe of last year, where I cast a wide net. And, uh, and I talked to anyone that was willing to talk to me. And, uh, and I garnered some ideas about what was going on outside of the military, what was going on outside of national security. Uh, I've always been impressed by the innovation, the speed that, uh, that our industry partners have been uh, leveraging for many, many years. And so I, I thought I, maybe we, we get into that type of business. And so my chapter two was pretty simple, find something that was meaningful. And, uh, and so along the way, I've been able to have some amazing conversations and talk to some visionary people in industry, uh, in national security spaces, uh, and in academia. And so that's where I've landed. After 29 years of taking uh, ourselves around the world, I brought my wife and I back to her home state of Oklahoma, where I have joined the University of Tulsa as the executive director of the Oklahoma Cyber uh, Innovation Institute. This is a brand new institute that we have just stood up. The vision is to bring together all of the ideas uh, of academia. And so the University of Tulsa is uh, uniquely postured. They have uh, vast experience in the cyberspace uh, arena uh, by way of cyber core programs. They have a cyber doctorate, uh, cyber fellows that, uh, that study at the university, a remarkable cadre of professionals that are teaching about cyber uh, in the future. So I'm coupled with that. I have the opportunity to think about workforce development uh, across the state of Oklahoma. And so I'm, uh, I'm truly excited about K through 12 and beyond and, uh, and what's the cyber education that we need to get after for not only the state of Oklahoma, but more importantly uh, for America's uh, digital future. And so really inspiring work there. Couple all of that with a little bit of responsibility of building out uh, and supporting the digital ecosystem that is building up in the Tulsa area, as well as the state of Oklahoma. And so as, as we have businesses that are coming in with their ideas, entrepreneurs that are coming in and wanting to stand up um, tech projects and tech companies, we need to marry up the workforce with them and, uh, and, and get them going. 
And so I get to be at the intersection of all of those activities together, the research, academia, uh, the, the workforce development piece, as well as uh, the entrepreneurial spirit and, uh, and some of the great work that's going on. And so I feel like I found some meaningful work uh, in my chapter two, and I'm excited to, uh, to launch. By way of uh, uh, some initial thoughts from me before I introduce each of our panelists, uh, I've been thinking about this uh, a lot. Uh, believe it or not, I'm on week number two of, uh, of my job, and so I'm less than 10 days into the job. Um, a lot of my work uh, up front, uh, kind of studying for my exam, if you will, uh, was researching what's going on across the enterprise. The White House has provided some remarkable uh, guiding principles uh, with, their, uh, with their workforce task force uh, and their technology workforce, uh, the work that has been going on with our national cyber director. Uh, and so I have, uh, I've done a lot of reading on what they are trying to inspire uh, at, the, uh, at the U.S. level and then how we can incorporate that into the state of Oklahoma. And so there's some, there's some great work that's going on. What I've learned and what I have, have uh, observed over many, many years is that the real power comes when you team people with technology. Uh, they, cannot, they cannot work in isolation. Uh, technology without the right people is just a tool. Uh, people without technology, you can't move fast enough to keep up with the, the digital world that we work in. And so it's marrying those two concepts, the people and the technology together, is what's going to inspire us moving forward really into America's digital future uh, that, that we aspire to. And so I think that this is goodness. I think that uh, the White House vision of where we want to go uh, enhances all of the things that seem to be important to us as voters, national security for our nation and the economy. And so those two things coming together, people and technology are gonna drive us forward into that. And so I'm really excited about that. The work that I'm trying to do in the state of Oklahoma that I'm, uh, that I'm inspiring to, uh, aspiring to is, uh, is to build some unity of effort in the way that we think about marrying those people and that technology together. And I think that it's, uh, it's really some unity of action and unity of vision that is required up front. When you have the state house and uh, the state government involved, when you have academia, when you have the businesses that all are, are collaborating and talking, and then you bring in the individual person, there's real power and real unity of action if you can get all of those things working together. And so that's what I'm trying to do, at, at least up front, is build that ecosystem where you collaborate uh, and talk to one another about, uh, about technology and how do we harness uh, technology for our future. And so some goodness going on there. The recognition is that uh, everyone uh, is going to need some sort of foundational uh, educational skills. And so we're going to uh, look at how do we take cyber and digital and tech down in, into uh, each and every school, every K through 12 student, every teacher that's in a classroom, give them the tools to, uh, to teach uh, our, our future, uh, that of our students, uh, what they need to know about securing uh, our digital future. And so I'm excited about that. There's also a recognition in this new role, and finally, uh, is that we need to have some continuing education. It's one thing to get in uh, and have a conversation with a student and give them the entry level skills and education that is required. But it's another thing to build up some sort of ecosystem that supports uh, their, their continued growth. It could be clubs, it could be professional organizations, it could be skills, it could be training, it could be resources that we allow these students uh, to, uh, to grab onto and to bring their skills into the workforce. Really excited about where we're going. I'm really excited about the role that, uh, that I'm gonna um, play in, uh, in helping pull this unique ecosystem together uh, for now my home state. And so um, thanks for a couple of minutes of letting me tell you what's going on uh, in our, our, our part of the country in our state. So the real reason you're here is to hear the experts that we've assembled on this, uh, on this panel. And so uh, I'd like to introduce our first panelist. Um, I had an opportunity to work hand in hand with, uh, with Lauren uh, as she was leading uh, the innovation efforts for our Department of the Air Force and our Department of, uh, well, that includes the Air Force and the Space Force. Uh, 
she played a unique role uh, in helping collaborate, bring together innovation uh, as our chief innovation officer for the Department of the Air Force, and then uh, our chief information officer. And uh, and I got to uh, I got to witness um, her uh, her abilities, her ability to pull together a vision, and then more importantly, communicate that vision across. Uh, across the entire Department of the Air Force. It was an inspiring message. She had buy-in from the leadership in the Pentagon to our youngest airmen on the flight line, and I got to see her in all types of forums. More importantly, I saw her tested uh, as we went through COVID together. And, uh, and what I will tell you is that many, many late night calls and, uh, and calls around the clock trying to figure out how to transform our Air Force seemingly overnight uh, to enable them to, uh, to continue uh, national security. And so um, she has just been a remarkable teammate and someone that I have uh, looked up to uh, for many, many years now. And so it is my privilege to introduce now in her new role as the Chief Innovation Officer for SAIC here in Washington, D.C. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, please give it up for Ms. Lauren Knossenberger. Lauren, right. over to you. Well, thanks, Chad. And it's it's great to see you here again, too, transformed from General Radigi to Mr. Radigi here. The hair is a little longer. Uh, the hair is longer. You get traded in the camo for the suit. Yeah, indeed. Very well done. Very well done. <laughs> And um, you know, and great to see uh, yeah. you know another another old friend and colleague on this side from Microsoft, and then new friends, of course, from Oklahoma. Um, you always have to have to have more friends from Oklahoma for sure. For sure. <laughs> um, so, you know, it's so funny as you were talking about COVID. It it almost I know it's yesterday, but it it, it kind of feels like a lifetime ago too. And and I think back to 2020, the Department of the Air Force, and actually a lot of um, a lot of corporations ar around the world valued in-person work a lot more mm -hmm. um, and in the military culturally it was just like if i don't see you you're not actually working there's no way you know being remote work you know working from home was kind of how people felt about it uh, in the military at the time and we went from no capacity to work from home to a merry band of people from around the world more than a merry band a, a pretty pretty uh, lethal force there deploying within a matter of weeks really um, getting getting all 750,000 plus uh, airmen plus contractors across multiple networks digital. So yeah, I hadn't thought about that in a minute. And, um, and it is something that, that we should continue to feel pretty proud of and the sure. kind of the, um, the digital and cultural trans transformation that came from that. Um, so, and that's fantastic that you're, you're looking at, at the next generation of, of kids and how can we bring people into that mm -hmm. field. Um, I'll share with the audience just because uh, I'm sure there are a couple of folks out there that don't know me, but um, a big part of my story is that about eight years ago, um, I accidentally joined the Air Force, um, was, was uh, effectively tackled by a bunch of three-star generals, um, and I had never met a general before in my life at that point. Uh, but I was, I was told I needed to serve my country um, because I was passionate about the problems uh, that were faced by the department at the time. And I really just wanted to come in and, and see what I could do to bring emerging technology into the Department of Defense. And um, just found a, a really incredible community there, um, still have a deep love of the Air Force and then the Space Force, which came along during my time there. Mm -hmm. Um, and uh, just as I thought I was going to escape to go back to, to private industry, um, was asked to stick, stick around another, another few years to be the, the chief information officer. And uh, we'll say, I guess, you, how many years did you have in? 29. 29. Um, I'm still 29, so, um, you know, so not, not as many years served. But um, I have to say that the, the, the seven and a half years that I spent, mm -hmm. it was such an honor. Um, to be able to serve uh, beside these airmen and guardians and to, to get after these problems. And you know, if you look at what really motivates people, um, at least uh, it probably, probably a lot of uh, your crew is too, when you can get in and solve problems that you can't solve anywhere else, I mean, there are some gnarly, gnarly problems in the DOD. And we got to be on the front lines of solving those, and it feels amazing. And so um, I am only a little bit more retired than you are. Um, I, I retired from the department in June, um, and uh, I guess I didn't get to stay retired for long. I did, I did travel around Europe this summer, spent some time with my, my little girls, um, and then in October, uh, jumped into SAIC, and um, 
it actually, if you'd asked me in June, you know, are you going to jump into the defense industrial base? I would have said, absolutely not. There is, you know, the, okay. the pro- actually, I probably would have said something close to what I said to General Bender when uh, he first said, you need, you need to join the Air Force. Um, I said, I'm, I'm incredibly honored, but the probability is approaching zero. I think I said something along those lines. That's what I would have said, actually, about, about mm-hmm. um, the defense industrial base. But, um, you know, as, as I kind of went through the summer and thought about what was really important, um, I kind of felt like I wasn't done solving some of the problems, but but perhaps uh, maybe from a different vantage point. And I actually had lunch with uh, Josh Marcuse today, who he's now at Google. Um, he was with the Defense Innovation Board, which has been such uh, another great uh, power for good uh, in our Defense Department with insights from folks like Eric Schmidt and Adam Grant um, and uh, Neil deGrasse Tyson, um, Milo Maydean. Um, and it was just kind of good to go back a few years and, and think about all of those problems that we've, we've moved the needle on, but we have some new things to go. Mm-hmm. And so um, one of the things that drew me to, to SAIC, uh, first of all, I'll say the, the big one that got me interested in the conversation is Tony Towns Whitley, right. um, who was most recently the president of regulated industries uh, at Microsoft. Um, so I'm sure you all know She's each other well. She's an amazing well. person. She yeah. is an amazing person, an amazing leader. Um, SAIC chose her to be their CEO. Right. And what that told me was, this is a company. It's a trusted company, but it's not. You know, you don't. It's not. It wasn't. You know, I didn't think of it as the coolest company. You know, in sure. June when I was thinking about this, <laughs> but it's like, okay, that's bold. Hiring Tony Towns Whitley, that is bold. And then Tony asking me, you know, hey, we really, we have some, we have some good capabilities as a company. Right. We want to really, really double down on our capabilities. We want to be the defense industrial base company that our DOD truly needs. Um, and pretty much all of the things that I care about, Tony cares about as she's trying to grow this, um, this uh, already Fortune 500 company. Right. Um, to continue to solve these problems. And so um, being able to look at how do you bring emerging tech to not just the DOD market, but to the civilian market through the lens of an integrator um, who truly can look at what are the best companies in Silicon Valley and how do I then de-risk that technology, help that technology scale, do some real vetting, maybe help a company get fed ramped and bring that in to make a, cohe- a more cohesive solution, probably partnering with a Microsoft um, or, you know, or another um, hyperscaler, um, bringing in capabilities from um, you know, any number of software vendors. You know, um, we, we certainly do a lot with, uh, with ServiceNow and others as well. Um, and to truly look at that end-to-end, at scale, making sure that things are secure, um, that, is, that is something that I remain passionate about. Mm-hmm. And especially, um, I, I saw Honorable Heidi Hsu uh, recently put out some, um, some new language on digital engineering. Mm-hmm. And it was, it was so timely because those are the things that, um, that actually SAIC as a company has invested in so heavily um, over the past number of years that I am personally very passionate about. Um, and so it was pretty cool to see you know, language come out that basically validates, hey, you are on the right track. Um, and then as well with uh, some of the AI capabilities. So whereas you and I were you know, deep in the trenches trying to make sure that we could operate in this digital world and that we could keep our workforce engaged, whether they were um, you know, at the, uh, you know, in their bedroom in Oklahoma or um, I don't know, I guess yeah. in a, uh, having, having a, you know, in a really beautiful, uh, probably nature themed room over at Microsoft. Yeah, right. Um, <laughs> Or uh, in the in the halls of the Pentagon, yes. um, you know we we can be proud of that. And then I think over the next few years, it, it really is going to come down to um, even beyond digital. How can we truly bring information to people's fingertips at a speed that we have never seen before? And and generative AI, I mean, is a is a huge player there um, with ChatGPT. Well invested. Right. Good job. Um, and um, you know, and some of the other uh, competitor capabilities in generative AI. Um, I mean, it is for this generation now, and for us, kind of the same thing that happened with us and smartphones and and the internet. It mm-hmm. is that much more powerful. And uh, 
pretty neat too. I, I, I'm curious to see what happens um, with kind of the software development life cycle over time too, because more and more developers right. are leveraging Gen of AI to at least help with code. Um, mm -hmm. right. We don't want to have it write our code for us yet. It's mm -hmm. going to give you C plus code, mm -hmm. um, not the programming language, but you know, uh, yeah. on your paper. Um, and so, um, yeah, it'll be really interesting to see, but I'm, I'm glad to be back in the game from a different vantage point. It is, um, you know, it's, it's, I have a great uh, kind of new cohort over at SAIC. Um, I, I do run our, uh, our corporate strategy um, as well as our innovation factories. So I have the guys that kind of build the cool stuff uh, for the corporation, and that's been a lot of fun. So it's a, a new challenge for me. It's a new way for us to partner um, and uh, kind of a new way to contribute to mission. We'll, we'll see where it goes. Perfect. Thank you, Lauren, for your comments, uh, and it's it's great to have you back in the game. Uh, it's good I, to be I, in the I game. I think I speak for everyone in DoD that you were probably the the hot free uh, free agent that was out there, and we were all waiting to see where <laughs> you were going to go. And uh, I'm thrilled to see that you've landed someplace that you are doing some meaningful work and bringing your talents to our defense industrial base. So all right, we're ready for that Super Bowl reign over at over at <laughs> there, SAIC. There you go. <laughs> There you go. Well, thank you very much. We look forward to having a, a conversation uh, with you as we move forward. Uh, our next panelist, uh, it is my privilege to, uh, to introduce. And, uh, and I, I don't know what your, uh, your family would say about you, but I want you to know that I would consider you one of the most interesting men in the world. What an introduction. What an, well, hey, there's, <laughs> there's more. And so uh, part of that introduction is USA water polo, uh, he is a presidential scholar with the uh, George W. Bush Presidential Center. Yeah, um, wonderful organization. He is a he's a retired Marine fighter pilot. Uh, FA-18 uh, flew, uh, flew sorties all over the world, uh, involved in some very big missions, important missions for our national defense. Um, but what I think is so unique about you, and we've only had an opportunity to meet each other in the last couple of months. Right. You were part of that chapter two interview that I was doing of finding, finding people that, uh, that I was drawn to, that I was excited to work with, that I loved the vision and the passion that you brought to a game. And, uh, and that's what you do on a daily basis. And so I'm excited to see how all of our circles are gonna start interacting. Um, but uh, I really do call you one of the most interesting men in the world. And, uh, and what I think is really cool about you is you have found your why. I think, and so I, yeah. I know you, you may go into that a little bit, sure. but uh, you finding your why and, uh, and bringing that to work every day uh, for a big corporation like Microsoft is inspiring work. And so I think we're going to have to hand them a dose of keys. Uh, uh, I know, yeah, maybe. It's like we're, we're, we're that, missing, that, may come, that, opportunity. that may come after this panel. Okay. Uh, but ladies and gentlemen, he is now the general manager for security solutions for Microsoft Federal. Uh, please welcome uh, Mr. Vishal Ami. Well, thanks for Sir, having over me. to you. I don't, I don't even know how to follow that introduction. I, you know, my family would probably um, not agree with you, especially my three young children. <laughs> they don't think what I do is exciting anymore. I think, I think your initiatives should hopefully change that with the K through 12 initiatives. Um, I think when my son and uh, daughter go to the flight line now and they say, "Wait, you used to do that? Why not anymore? Why?" Why are you behind your computer all day? Right. And I think that's that's the realities of, of what I do now, but I think making cyber exciting is is something amazing. You know, it's funny, you said you said you joined the Air Force as a mistake. Yeah, by accident. It wasn't a mistake, but it was an accident. <laughs> you know, quick sidebar, uh, when I joined when I, I originally enlisted in the Marine Corps, and when I originally enlisted in the Marine Corps and during Clinton's administration, um, I had no intention to join. And the cold caller called my house, or the recruiter called my home, and my father or my mother picked up and they said, hey, Vishal's not here. And I was living in another state at the time playing water polo. Mm -hmm. And I came home and my father said, hey, there is this, he called it the army, army guy. <laughs> so the army guy called, you should go down to the office and, and get your name off the calling list. They've been calling here every week. And you know, we had, the yellow pages and the white pages, and you know, at that time we used to trade those in for ice cream cones at Thrifty on, on uh, during spring break. But they, you know, I said, all right, I'll go down to the the office, and I rode my bike down to go 
took my name off the calling list. I mean, I, I was a 17 year old, had no backbone, and I mean, they read me pretty good. I walked through those doors and I wasn't about to leave those doors without an enlistment in the Marine Corps. And I didn't know how to say no. It was no, no national security events going on at the time. It was just, they had convinced me to enlist. And I remember uh, coming from a large family, a lot of doctors and professional folks. I walked my bike home that day because <laughs> I was too scared to share with my mother that I enlisted in the Marine Corps. And when I told her that uh, uh, she was crying and she's like, you can't do it. And I said, it's okay. I'm only 17. You have to sign the consent. And my father actually looked at me and he said, hey, in this family, when you make a commitment to something, you do it. And they signed it. And I went back and I enlisted in the Marine Corps. Best mistake I've ever made 21 years later, mm. right? Commissioned, got to fly in some beautiful aircraft, do some amazing things, um, both on the ground, in the air, back on the ground, and then here. So That's thought awesome. I'd share that quick sidebar. I, I mean, what we do at Microsoft is amazing work. And, but I think it's, it's those types of moments in my life that have shaped my why and my commitment to our industry. I think this panel is really fascinating and amazing simply because all of us come from different walks of life. We all do different things and we all ended up here for different reasons. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I'll briefly go into my why. I, there's, a, there's a whole plethora of my career and my history of deployments and things I've been able to do both on the enlisted side, on the officer side, uh, leading Marines and joint organizations and units. Uh, and in, 2015, I got into cyber. And sure, I, I do cyber at Microsoft. I have some brilliant folks on the team that do security, compliance, identity. I have some, I have, we, have, we have sales teams, we have business program management teams, we have individuals that work with our engineering orgs and our, and our CELA orgs. And they've been doing this forever. And I ended up having the privilege to work with these folks like I did it in, in service in, in uniform because we are all connected because we're so passionate about cyber. And in 2015, I was involved, uh, I, I entered the cyber in industry because the Islamic State Hacking Division released all my information all over the public media. And I found out that my data was compromised from CNN with my name, my picture, my phone number, my address, everything on there with, uh, with a message saying go to this person's home and go kill them and kill their family and for two years after that moment I lived under protection and 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 extra uh, vigilance and I chose to retire shortly after and dedicate my life to protecting the identity and data and from someone who hasn't worked at that time hadn't worked with networks and and connectivity and data my thought was before that, national security was what we did when we operated overseas, when we went and, and did these missions, when we retrieved personnel from embassies, when we went and f flew sorties um, and supported Marines on the ground with surface-to-air and air-to-air fires. Uh, for me, national security was doing our country's bidding and defending democracy. And I spoke about this a little bit this morning with some of our Department of Defense uh, family, uh, the Air Force mm -hmm. and Navy, and I shared that 10 years ago, we probably wouldn't have grasped that cyber and, and the importance of data and analytics was almost part of this maneuver warfare. It was part of our national mission set. It actually triggered or was influential in everything we did. And what I realized when my name was targeted, when my family was put in jeopardy and at risk physically and tangibly it happened, and we had intercepts to our home months after that, that it didn't matter what you did, how you did it, when it affects the human, when it affects the things you love most in this world, your kids, your family, your home, and you're not overseas, you're not behind these physical and digital barriers, it, it triggered a whole new different level for me. And that's, that's where I find my why. That's where I find my passion. 
and I taught myself our industry, and I learned so much from individuals like yourselves, like the innovations that happened. When I joined Microsoft, I joined on March 2nd of 2020, and four days later, COVID. So I went from an organization that was pushing on the boundaries of innovation, that had a partner with industry to totally change the way we're doing things. Um, and I wasn't even working with the Department of Defense. I found that calling about a year into Microsoft when I came back into the industry and said, I need, we need to do more for our warfighters. We need to do more for our civil servants and our communities. So I know we'll get into this a little more and I don't wanna chew up all the time, but I think we, we are all here for different reasons, but at the core of what, if, we ha if you have a why and you can understand how innovation and how data fits into the outcome of what all of our organizations are trying to do. I mean, you mentioned what SAIC is doing, and you know, I would, I would, I would say organizations like the DIB aren't just building new technologies and fostering growth. They are the core and the central portion of how we are innovating. With the declining workforce, with the cyber skills gap, organizations like SAIC are now manning, staffing, and building innovations to carry out these national security missions moving forward. I mean, I look at some of the most innovative healthcare organizations in the world, like the VA, mm -hmm. who in our community, many folks say, well, the VA is not innovative. The VA was one of the first healthcare organizations to create gaming for, vet, for wounded warriors when they came back. I mean, and that happened years ago. So data and innovation is at the core of all of our why and all of, all of what we're trying to do. And I'm really excited to have some of, this, some of these conversations with you today. So I'll pass it back over to you. Vishal, thank you very much. Uh, it is inspiring uh, that you have transformed your why into action and, uh, and to see what you're doing uh, from, from your workspace, uh, but also the associations that you have with America's Future Series, uh, with with Cyber Patriot and others, uh, thanks thanks for what you're doing. It's oh, great to have you. you as a teammate. Ladies and gentlemen, it's my privilege to introduce our third and final panelist. Now, this gentleman um, from the state of Oklahoma uh, is actually a. Uh, this is the first time I've met him in person. Uh, he was uh, he was part of my chapter two conversations that I started having. And as I started kind of dialing into where I wanted to go in the world and, uh, and the industry that I wanted to be in, um, I had an opportunity to make a phone call. And, uh, and we had a late night phone call um, where uh, on the spot, you described your vision uh, for not only the state of Oklahoma, but beyond. Um, and I read passion in everything that you said. And, uh, and so I can remember on the spot, having not even met you, I said, hey, we've got this panel coming up in January, and, uh, and I think your voice needs to be heard. And so, RJ, I want you to know that uh, you in particular were one of the reasons you inspired me to stay in the state of Oklahoma and be involved under your, your umbrella of what you're building uh, for our great state. And so I just want to thank you for that. He is a Marine reservist and spends time uh, with the Marine Innovation Unit. In fact, is flying home to uh, to Austin today. My home. Yes, <laughs> flying home to Austin uh, with uh, with LBJ uh, University of Texas at Austin mm -hmm. uh, moniker on your uh, on your jacket. But flying home and uh, going to spend some time with the innovation unit. So thanks for your continued service to our nation in uniform. Um, he has also spent some time as an information security manager for the city of Tulsa. And uh, now he is in the Attorney General's office. So he is the Deputy Attorney General uh, for Cybersecurity, Technology, and Digital Assets for the state of Oklahoma. And so, ladies and gentlemen, please help me welcome Richard Jackson. RJ, over to you. Well, thanks for being here, and I, I hope I can, uh, I can honor your, your investment to decide to move yourself and uh, your family back to Oklahoma. Hopefully that was, <laughs> hopefully that's like, we made a good down payment. I'm oh. glad that he put uh, that on you. Good, yeah. good so far. But, well, I, I hope I will live up to that investment. I'll make it worth it for you. Um, and so I'll actually borrow some of the comments that we've made here today about one, wanting to be an integrator and in what we've seen when it, uh, when things become real for you, uh, working in, uh, I was an aide for several years, two years to be exact, it felt like a decade. Um, but I got to learn, I got to see the, the, just beyond the horizon about what the, the, 
big thinkers in the DOD were trying to understand and ascertain about what's in the adjacent possible for the needs of the nation. And so having that perspective as an eight-year, at that time, eight-year veteran of the military, I, I hope to have translated the strategic to the tactical. What does that mean for me? And what ultimately came through as a, as a, as a thesis of the line, byline, maybe even a why, is that it recognized with the emergence of great power competition, some of the economic struggles uh, that we are facing here in the United States, monetary and fiscal issues, you know, the issues that we're facing with demographics, whether it be educational, whether it be aging population, is that we are in a period of transition and there needs to be a vanguard willing to take up the mantle of pursuing that into the future. And if, um, if not us, then who? So, so taking that on as, as an opportunity to, mm -hmm. to, to uh, lowercase l lead, not, not by virtue of, I guess, uh, anything that I think that I'm doing special other than pursuing it. And so I did, I did want to comment. I actually joined the Marine Corps on purpose, not on accident, <laughs> but I did, get into, I did well, get into cyber on accident. And so I, I joined the, the, the Marine Corps. I'd, after, I'd already gone to law school. I'd already graduated. I'd already passed the bar and was already practicing. And I had a, what I affectionately call my, my quarter-life crisis of conscience in that I was right up against the age limit on, on joining. And it was one of those, if you don't do it now, you're never going to get to do it. So I, I intentionally went to the, the, uh, the recruiter and, and joined. But I got into cyber on accident. After I came back, I uh, uh, actually decided to restart an education career, went back through, went to a job fair, and someone misread my... Uh, my resume and forwarded it to a cybersecurity contractor thinking that I had a clearance that I did not actually possess. They were very interested in interviewing me. We had one interview where they actually read the document and I was not hired. But fortunately for me, <laughs> fortunately for me, one of their clients was looking for someone who was more in the policy space than in technical. And they said, well, you're a lawyer. You understand, you understand what's required from a policy, policy perspective. Would you be willing to do it in cyber? And I asked, does it pay? They said, yes. And they said, well, absolutely, of course. Um, and that was the city of Tulsa. And so I started, started what's now a 10-year career in cybersecurity, and then it branched out into other novel and emerging technology spaces, and then in, and proposed to then Attorney General-elect uh, what is now the job that I have, a role that we would uh, be willing to demonstrate leadership in economic and business development around novel and emerging technologies with an emphasis on dual use or defense innovation is that there's there's going to be a real need in five, 10 years for the work that we're doing today, but we have to put in the work today. And so that's that's really why this job exists and what we're intending to produce and, ha and look forward to expanding on the conversation about where that's going and the way we think about it. Amazing. RJ, uh, you're living up to it so far. All right. uh, it's great to meet you in person. I look forward to doing uh, good things with you in the, uh, in the state of Oklahoma. And, uh, and hopefully we branch out from there and, uh, and, and uh, take some of these uh, ideas and vision and uh, take it to the national level. So thanks, thanks for being here. The way that we assembled this panel, and I want to thank each of you up front for, uh, for agreeing to, uh, to be part of this. It's been, um, you know, amazing leaders uh, with amazing visions and you're, and you're wise. And, uh, and you've inspired me in many ways. And so thanks for coming and being, uh, being part of this. I'd be interested, uh, as we kind of structured this, um, I thought about you know, the enterprise or world view versus the state view that RJ has. And so um, going with the theme of our panel, the digital future, how are you thinking about that with your companies and then perhaps at the state level? You know, what, what, are, what conversations are taking place at Microsoft headquarters and SAIC and then in the state of Oklahoma? to think about digital future and how are you unifying that? And so, RJ, maybe if I can start with you uh, and, and we'll kind of build from uh, tactical to strategic. Sure, so I, I will actually start off um, really with kind of two observations. One, that digital future, we could kind of get meta and drop the digital and say that the future, speaking now uh, nationally, the future of the United States is a digital future. There is no distinction. And so if you think in the one sense, on the one hand we have the information domain that is an abstract concept, and then we have the physical domains, land, sea, air, now space, uh, where those things used to be tangent was inside of our heads. You'd make right, the OODA loop. You'd make an observation that is data that occurred. The, you would take that, you would orient it, which is turn data into information. You would make a decision, and then you would act back in the physical space. Now that tangent occurs more and more, and perhaps ever increasingly, and almost sometimes exclusively, through some type of platform. 
whether it's a technology, whether it's uh, you know C5ISR, we could get into the details, but there is now a, a technology nexus where those two places are tangent. And I would call that the new logical domain that is cybersecurity. So the future of the U.S. is going to live at what, in that littoral between the abstract and the, the physical worlds that is the cyber logical domain. So that's the one element. And then thinking about technology from the state's perspective, if that's the future that we are we're pursuing from a national or, or global perspective. How can we as a state be an integrator for those who are doing those very difficult things in technology space? Can we, can we build and develop the systems and processes that make those things easier? And so what we're, the conversation that we're trying to have in the state of Oklahoma is effectively a public-public-private partnership, a, a tripartite partnership where the state is working in concert with the federal government. How can we be a better partner to you, the federal government, particularly in the DOD? Again, an emphasis around dual use defense innovation. How can we be a better partner to you, private industry? And how can we facilitate interactions between the two? So can we establish laws, statutes, regulations, systems, policies, processes as a whole of state effort to make what you do easier to do in the state of Oklahoma? The intent following from that is that we want to be the premier jurisdiction for that type of innovation space. And so it's less about the technology, more about the process for us. How do we help facilitate things being done in the Marine Innovation Unit, at AFWorks, at Naval X, all of the things that we recognize that if we stay pl platform specific, that that will calcify and grow old, but the process of innovating and developing that next thing, if we can create a competitive advantage there, that translates not just for the state, but for the United States, and then again, a strategic overmatch that hopefully averts great power competition becoming great power crisis or conflict. That's great. Love what you're doing at the state. I see how he convinced you to move to Oklahoma. I, I know. I, I mean, yeah. it's inspiring, isn't it? Yeah, and I'm gonna start rumors love, that he was the recruiter that pulled yeah. the shawl into the Marine Corps. Probably. I, I well, that's, that's, that's a good rumor. I, I, it depends on what part of the uh, Clinton administration. I might have been a little young. <laughs> oh. <laughs> we'll just pretend. Just pretend. We'll just, just, just pretend. Timeless. Timeless. Pretend. I'll, I'll take yeah. that. Yeah. Michelle, yeah. What, what, what are your thoughts? What, how, do you, how do you think about the digital future uh, at Microsoft? So Satya years ago said something, and I think many, some great leaders have said this, every organization is a security or a technology company mm -hmm. and a digital company. Um, the way I look, and I think as, as Microsoft looks at this, and, and this is my opinion and the way we should look at it, is less about the products, more about the processes, but we have to still focus on the outcome, the people, the human behind it. I think it's. I think every organization, uh, when we build technology, when we build product, when we build services, when we build offerings, I think when we start getting away from the human element and the outcome-focused pieces of innovation, we lose sight of what we're doing and how we're doing it. Uh, a great example of this is where the cybersecurity community and large enterprises like Microsoft have come. You know, years ago, you can look at Microsoft as a single entity and say, hey, it's a platform, it's a technology platform, we have, we have, we have all these Defender products that protect servers and infrastructure and, uh, and IoT. And now I look at our strategy as, how do we actually partner with industry? with AWS, with Google, with SAIC, to open up our ecosystem so that we can actually make things easier for the end users, mm -hmm. how we can make it seamless for those individuals in all of our critical infrastructure sectors. And what I mean by that is when we work with hospitals, when we work with the Department of Defense, and the Air Force was amazing to work with, um, one of the things that we spoke to the Air Force a lot about was you know, there's products and services that, um, and the Navy that, that these warfighters use on the edge in air-gapped environments um, that really help them achieve mission and gain visibility. You don't want to just rip and replace the technology. How do we bring some of those legacy processes, those technologies, into our fold now and boost them up so we, don't, so we have continuity of operations? Uh, and I think we have to look outside of the traditional spaces where Microsoft has played. 
in the in the past and where we have are currently uh, similar to a lot of our other cloud organizations um, a majority of our business in the past has been in software and has been in cloud but I think it's important to see how when when you said end to end with when you started I now look at end to end not just as our devices and endpoints and identity I look at it as for me I look at it as my home mm -hmm. and then I look at it as mission and there's people on both ends not just devices and telemetry so when we talk about where we need to be as an organization we need to open up our ecosystem and do more than just protect servers and infrastructure we have to start looking at things like misinformation and disinformation we have to start looking and working heavily with and partnering with our U.S. government um, allies on, on secure elections. And we have to start doing things that actually affect our democratic processes, our way of life here. I mean, and again, Microsoft, is, I look at us now as being more of a conduit to mission and an enabler to do more good, right? We are not the end state. We're not just the mission objective. We're we're the, we need to be the individuals that bring in all these collective partners, open up our ecosystem to do more good. And, I, and, and that's, how I, that's where I see the role of enterprise technology. Um, the reason I keep referring earlier on, and even now, where I see organizations like SAIC, I think the DIB space specifically, and not just for the industry, not just for defense, but these service integrators are the let's call them the OGs of, of companies that actually had to bring in all of our different products, all of our different services, attach people to the processes, to the technology and say, listen, Microsoft, you're doing it this way. Google, you're doing it this way. AWS, you're doing it this way. We're gonna actually have to tie this all together and make it real for our customers. And I think all of us in enterprise technology have to get there. We have to do more in that space. We have to be more inclusive. So hopefully I answered your question a little bit. I, I really think there's a new wave of investment we need to make in enterprise cloud and inter, in enterprise technology. And, and you, you mentioned we're all moving to platform. I, I look at Microsoft as a platform, a digital platform that enables more good, that helps us protect more individuals, that helps us um, drive more innovation and drive more change. When we spoke about COVID, it wasn't, the mission wasn't to get everyone virtual. The mission was how do we get people to talk and collaborate and continue the mission without being in person? Yeah. Had nothing to do with the technology, had everything to do with the outcome of what we needed to get done. And I think the DOD and the Air Force specifically did an amazing job of getting that done in such a short period of time. Um, I mean, we were proud to be part of that, but just like every other organization, it had nothing to do with the technology and it had everything to do with making the processes and putting the law and the policy behind it and then making sure that the outcome was met from the warfighters, the sailors, the guardians, the marines, um, the airmen, and I'm sure I left out a few. But again, the technology was just in there, and that's what we have to get to. We have to start thinking outside of the box a little bit. Well, I know Lauren's smiling because uh, you, you gave the Air Force credit for our COVID response, and uh, and she was the one leading that effort. And so uh, we have a lot of pride uh, in 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 your words. Thank you uh, from a from a customer standpoint, uh, former customer of yours, um, the the work that you're doing to take that integration uh, piece off of the customer. Uh, too often, you know, we we were responsible for trying to assess all of the technologies that were out there, find best of breed, and figure out the interoperability between them. To hear your vision of where you're trying to go, where you're getting into that space and helping solve and come in with a, with a solution is, is amazing. Can I us. add one thing uh, real quick? I think it's also important for us as a, as a technology industry to be transparent and honest about things. I mean, I'm in the cybersecurity space. Yeah. And I believe, and look what happened to me personally, everyone goes through a compromise. Everyone goes through incidents. And as a DOD, we all do it. And I think that's, that's the key differentiator that we see in these su successful companies now is we're honest, we're transparent, we, we see the issues, we mitigate, and we overcome. And it shows resilience. And I think that's a key portion of this innovation journey that, that, that you're alluding to is 
having that open and honest and transparent conversation. It's amazing. Innovation Absolutely. journey. We're racing toward our, our finish line where we're going to get cut off. And I can't think of a better person to, uh, to bring us home. I'd love to hear your thoughts, Lauren, on, uh, on the, the digital future and how you're thinking about that at SAIC. All right. Well, first, I have to say it's been a pleasure to be part of this uh, joint task force today. Mm -hmm. uh, Air Force and Marine Corps here are taking over the world together. <laughs> um, it, it's always a good thing. Um, for me, um, I, think, I think one of the biggest, uh, most important words right now is going to be focus, mm -hmm. uh, probably. Because it, if I look at what we truly want uh, for our government and for our military, we're all citizens. Um, we all want our government to be really effective in the way that it takes care of our citizens. We also want it to be efficient. You know, we don't want right. to waste a bunch of time. Um, we don't want to waste our time as we're getting these services. We don't want government employees wasting time. And even more important in the military, if you have somebody who is willing to sign up at 17 to serve, um, you you want you want folks to be able to focus on the mission. And people on mission is always going to be you know the most critical um, asset and and the most uh, and the least uh, available. Um, and so anything that we can do to keep people on mission and to keep our government and our military um, moving forward with the, with the data and information needed to make the right decisions, that people are equipped and they're able to do the mission at hand and not distracted by something else that is just, you know, it, the, when, when easy things become hard, which, sure. which still happens. Sure. And there's plenty of work to do in those areas. If I look at what I want to see for SAIC toward solving those problems, we are we are going through right now. Um, you know, with the new CEO, with me coming in, we're looking at what are the things that we truly believe we can do better than anyone else that we uniquely can bring to the fight. How do we really focus on those things? And um, and and I have you know my my own thoughts at this mm -hmm. point. You know, two and a half months in on on where are we strongest. And then what are the problems that we care the most about solving? And we are a, a very DOD and, and, and federal civilian uh, both focused company, but what are those national imperatives, those things that we must do as a nation really well? And how do we especially take those things that we do best and apply those to that problem? And I, I kind of use that framework as I'm thinking about myself and career choices in life too. Um, you know, and I think we all do. Anytime that you can take what you do best and you can contribute to something that you uniquely can do, yeah. just everyone wins. Um, and so, um, and so that's really my goal over the next year. Um, so I'm, I'm with a company that um, just does incredible work, uh, both in um, kind of the the digital space and in in digital engineering. And how do we take? those things double down and apply them to some of the most critical missions. Um, one for sure that I know we'll be focused on is, is C5ISR and the, the civilian equivalent of that uh, typically is Enterprise to Edge. Um, and, uh, and how do we really, really drive home uh, some global uh, solutions uh, to those problems? Um, so I, I think that's, I mean, really it, it all comes down to Solving the most important problems, yeah. and um, you know, just being being pretty clear about what your conviction is around those, and so uh, it'll be fun. I hope we all get to kind of work together on some of these problems, and it's been a pleasure being here with you. It's been a pleasure indeed. Thanks to uh, thanks to each of you for uh, sharing some time. It's amazing uh, how fast an hour goes when you're having fun, and uh, inspired by the words that are uh, are being shared. So. Uh, thanks for being part of this. Again, thanks to the America's Future Series for uh, this opportunity. We look forward to future events together. Uh, until the next time, thanks, everyone. Out from here.